I, I came out here not having any idea what it was going to be like. The whole thing about living in the Southwest was so very different than living on the East Coast near Washington, D.C. Um, the, the landscape, the people, the climate, it was all so new and I loved it. And I knew then that I was never going to live anyplace else. Well, we started our podcast, and we had issues, so I have Star York on, but <laughs> we've had a nice 30 minute talk about cattle and fishing on the Chama and a variety of things, which we will probably get to. So I feel like we've, are, we've done half our podcast and we haven't even started yet. So <laughs> welcome Star, how are you? Just great, just great. I'm very grateful that things are going so well in terms of um, some of the things we're dealing with in, in these new times with COVID, but um, our lives haven't changed that much out here on the ranch because um, uh, Greg being a horse trainer has a lot of people who still come and that's not uh, a problem really with the COVID restrictions. Yeah. So we yeah. still stay pretty busy and um, uh, we've got animals that we deal with every day in terms of riding and taking care of our our uh, pack of dogs and so on. So we we don't feel very isolated. A pack of dogs. How many dogs do you have? Oh, four. <laughs> <laughs> and two of them are puppies. I can't. Why do you, so you that's go puppies? You got, why in the world do you go puppies? Oh, I just love the process. I guess that's why I enjoy raising horses so much is dealing with the the young ones, whether they're pups or foals. It's so much fun because you see them as they start learning about the world. And yeah. there's something that that youth, just like kids, bring to um, any life. And that is an excitement, enthusiasm about the world, you know, the newness of it. And, and I don't know, I just love to be around it. So um, I have to admit, I always, I've always gotten puppies rather than adopting yeah. old dogs. Pu puppies are good. I can hear somebody else talking in the background. I don't know if there's a person on the phone. Oh, uh, yeah. Hang on just a second. Yeah. Hey, you guys, would you please, um, I'm on a podcast. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Well, we can have um, it, but it might be, there might be some information that came that we didn't really want to hear. Yes. Right. <laughs> you, never, you, you never know. And so, yeah, you're really into horses though, right? I mean, you have a real ranch. You're just, you know, what, 30 miles north of Santa Fe with on the Chama and you have yeah. cattle and you have horses and, and your horses, what do you, do you do? Do you raise them to ride them or to, what do you do? With yes. Horses? Yeah. Yes. Um, we, I started uh, breeding and raising horses about, oh, 25 years ago, maybe maybe a little more than that. Well, yeah, it had to be more than that because I have one that was born here. The very first uh, foal born here is now 29 years old. <laughs> so it's been a while, but um, uh, I just enjoyed the process so much. Uh, there was a time when I was very involved with uh, some uh, equine sports like polo cross. And then I got into fox hunting and variety of different things. And so there's always been something to work towards in terms of their training. And mm -hmm. my favorite, I, I love quarter horses because they're so versatile and um, they seem to be able to, to do almost anything other than maybe uh, Grand Prix jumping. <laughs> I feel like great at that but uh, they just are very versatile. And I find it really interesting to try different stuff all the time. And I like them to be able to do many different things. But at this stage of my life, I'm more at a point where um, I really enjoy trail riding. We do compete some in ranch sorting, which is cutting cows. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, what Billy Shank does? Is that what Billy yes. Shank does? Yeah, do you yeah in fact, I started, I learned to team sort at his place. Yeah, oh yeah, I've been out there and watched that. Have you, so you yeah. competed with him. He said, he seems to be quite good, is he? Billy? He is, actually. Yeah. He and, a, and another friend, Jasper, 
And yeah, Bunny did, but uh, Billy and Jasper um, took a few years where they just traveled all over and competed constantly all the time. They'd go different to different states and go to different competitions. So he got really good. Yeah, and we're talking and about he, Billy Shank for those people who aren't under don't know yeah. who Billy is. He's one of our our artists and uh, is a world champion at that too, right? I guess. Yes, he is. Yeah. yeah. Well, and at his art, I mean, he's he's awesome. And he's quite a character. <laughs> and so you're, still, you're still doing that? Kind of uh, yeah, well, not this year because of COVID. Yeah. <laughs> Everything got canceled. But uh, yeah, I had a new, um, actually, it was a, a young Mustang that I was starting because all the babies I've raised here are getting up there in age. Yeah. And I still have one quarter horse that I do that a little bit on to. She's almost 20. So I, I'm trying to bring up the little... Um, Mustang Philly, but uh, she was from our local horse shelter that um, asked Greg to train, be a part of this uh, event, Gimme Shelter, where they ask 10 trainers to come in and train 10 completely green horses for 100 days, and then they auction them off. And it's amazing how much these trainers can do with them and how impressive they can be after 100 days. But Stella, the little Mustang I have now, was the first one that Greg trained, first year he did it. And um, we just kind of both fell in love with her. She, uh, she's just been great. So she's part of my herd now. And and I figured too, my older horses um, could stand to have a younger horse around to take <laughs> take some of the work off them. So yeah, how many horses do you have? Uh, <laughs> let's see. I have seven, and Greg has two. Oh yeah, so yeah, that's mm -hmm. a real, that is a herd. <laughs> yeah, a lot of, but you know, once hate. you're raising and you you've spent their life, you can't sell them. There, I have three or four that are uh, retired now. Yeah. So, you know, but they're going to be with me the rest of their lives. So when you have a horse like that, that's 29 years old that you raise from a colt, does it have a personality that you really understand completely or can they still do things that surprise you and do things that you go, oh, I had never seen that before? Um, that's a that's a good question. Uh, I think just like with human beings, <laughs> can always surprise you. I mean, just think about your spouse. You know? Right. No, I know. Right. You know them a long time and still there's always something. <laughs> you no, know, with, with the horses and when you've developed a really good, strong um, relationship, <clears throat> like Jet, he's the uh, black colt that um, was uh, born here over 18 years ago. And uh, my gosh, we've traveled at almost 10 different states in the country together and I've logged hundreds and hundreds of miles on him so all that time we're together you do get to know each other pretty well and uh I don't they're just so reliable to me they are prey animals and um unless they're they're sick or really um not you know, very old or whatever, you know, they they still can respond to things that startle them. Right. So, you know, they, they are big, dangerous creatures is, I guess, what I'm saying. So it's not like um, you can always feel like you don't have to be present. I think one of the things that is very valuable about uh, learning to get along and train horses is the importance of being present you know, having your mind present to you, the relationship you have with them. And in our culture, for human beings, I think we're really losing that ability because we're becoming so ADD. And so um, there are just so many things that, that draw our attention mm -hmm. that it's really hard to stay focused on a conversation and a, a real connection with another human being when you talk. So the horses kind of help you keep that skill, you know, about being present, not always thinking about the past or the future, but just being there with them. Right, at that like, very moment. And if you don't, you might end up getting kicked in the-, in the Right, 
somewhere. And that's what I mean. You know, yes, they can surprise you that way. But if you aren't present, that those things can happen. They like you to be there with them. Yes. And you have to spend time with all the horses, all nine horses, pretty much. <laughs> Yeah, it's, um, but I love that. That's part of what I enjoy about uh, living with my horses is I do like to interact with them, even the ones that are retired. Uh, they, they still need tension. It's, it's interesting that horses are so big and strong on one hand, but on the other hand, they're quite fragile because we keep them in a domesticated situation and in most of uh, horse owners' situations, they have to be kept in small areas and fed usually a certain type of hay. Mm -hmm. But horses have evolved to travel over thousands of miles and eat lots of variation of plants. And that is what keeps them healthy. So we have them in a very compromised situation to start with. And so it makes, it, makes them more fragile. They're more open to disease and colicking and all this other stuff uh, than they would be, were they able to live as they have evolved to live. Mm -hmm. So, well, and they've become a fairly significant part of your sculpture too. So, for people who have, don't know who Star York is, she's a sculptress and um, has been doing it a long time. And we're going to get into how you got into that. Uh, here okay. in a minute, but just since we're talking about horses, they've been quite important for you as a subject matter, right? Yes, and oddly enough, I didn't start doing horses until I was pretty far into my career, probably half, after 20 years, I finally started doing some horses, and uh, I'm not sure why it happened that way, but um, now I have been really enjoying exploring um, different types, different styles of presentation of what being equine is. Uh, I've done a series of the rock art mares that were inspired by cave paintings that are, are ancient. Um, and what I loved about them was that the drawings that I saw in these cave walls from 20 to 32,000 years ago. Right were these very pudgy, rounded, obviously mare type, uh, because of course, most of the horses in any herd are going to be mares, because there's usually just the one stallion. There might be some young colts running around, but for the most part, they're mares. Mm -hmm. And they just reminded me so much of my own pregnant mares. I even took a picture of, of uh, one of my um, mares when she was pregnant, and I'd played her in polo cross, so I had shaved her mane. So as she was pregnant, her mane was starting to grow out, was about this long, and I had braided her tail for the birthing. So like the cave drawings, she had this little short mane and a tiny skinny tail. And I took a picture of her, and she could have been one of those drawings in that yeah. Yeah, those photo. Are those are the in France, out of the cave in France, right? That you got those. Yes. Inspiration. Yeah. And uh -huh. so, how is, were you doing horses already before you saw those and went to that? Because those have become almost a trademark for you, in a, I think, in a weird way. Yeah. Actually, that's what started me on doing horses. Uh, that's what and I then thought. I got into doing other things like um, I had done some cowboy scenes involving horses, but they weren't really about the horse. Mm -hmm. And uh, but the the rock art got me excited about doing them again, and then I got interested in doing the the um, the male horse, which is what you see more on um, the Native American representations of horses, um, like on teepee paintings and stuff. They're um, the opposite to these rounded, voluptuous, short-legged uh, mares. There are these big chested, big uh, um, neck uh, horses that um, are, are much larger and have that male energy. It's just so different. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so I, that was kind of fun to do too. And then I did a series on the Da Vinci horses that were inspired by the Da Vinci drawings because he also was fascinated with how horses 
would take on the energy of the of their riders in battle, because then that was a good deal of what they trained horses for. They did have their beasts of burden, but the horses he drew were all these horses being trained to be war horses mm. and battle. And he would draw images of the expression of the horse's face next to the expression of the man, and it would be just alike, you know. And that really um, was interesting to me because I felt that's the way my horses were when um, we got to know each other so well and we're competing. And it's like we were like one. And they they just picked up on my energy and what I wanted. And you feel like you don't even need a bridle because they get it. They get what you're trying to do when they start following your body language so well that you barely need to ever touch the reins. Oh, that's and that's really cool. <laughs> it's just a, a very gratifying um, experience to have. And that takes a while to get to that point, I would assume, right? To be able to have that co copacetic kind of sensibilities between rider and horse. Yes. Yeah. I. Yes, it does. Years. Years, really. <laughs> it takes right? a lot of time working with them and just being with them. And yeah. Yeah. It does, but it's very gratifying. Yeah, we'll put a picture on the uh, for the YouTube people. We'll put a picture of the Da Vinci horse in because I've I've sold that a couple of times. That one big one. Yeah. That you had, yeah. Well, I've sold a lot of your sculptures over. There. Amazingly, if you think about it, we've, I've probably represented you for close to 20 years. It's hard to imagine. I know. Just, I know. How is that even possible? I don't know. <laughs> but, but we have. And we don't see each other that often either. I mean, you know, it might be every five years we actually have face to face. <laughs> yeah. Hard to believe that's true. But in our, our type of society, it's easy to, to kind of be connected with devices like this. So you don't tend to see people in the flesh as much, for sure. Yeah. And you can have, you know, that's the thing I would tell artists out there. You can have a relationship with a dealer. You don't have to see them and talk to them every day. I mean, you know, if you have a good dealer and it's a working relationship and you both are on the same page, you know, you pro provide the artwork and I provide the selling and, you know, you trust me and I trust you and it just kind of goes on and all of a sudden 20 years pass and you're going, oh, yeah. yeah, but that is a big issue. And that's why we can do it is because I've, uh, you guys have always been so incredibly ethical. I've always respected your taste and the way you present things and just doing business. And that's, I think that's a, a huge part of our being able to, to work a long distance yeah. is because we trust each other. Yeah, it's that's true. It. it makes it a lot easier to be yeah. able to have that sensibilities with each other. And just, you know, uh, if I have a problem, I can call you and you would go, oh, I can fix that or vice versa. And I can't ever really, oh, wow. and it, yeah, I, you know, and there's very, been very few problems in 20 years. Um, that I, yeah, which I, well, you know, of course, having said that, you know, now there'll be some, <laughs> something happen. We'll like, oh my God, how are we going to do it? Well, life, life is full of challenges after all, but uh the thing is, if, you, if you're dealing with someone who shares the same sort of um, ethics, it, it, you can always resolve it. Yeah. It, it always means you can work out something without it being a big issue. So yeah. um, I think that's why it's been so easy for us because issues have come up, but we've always just dealt with them best we can and it's worked out. Yeah. I think when you put money aside and you're more concerned about the relationship than the money, then things fall out much easier. Um, and some dealers can't yeah. do that. Some galleries can't do that. You know, it's really about yeah. where's mine, you know? And where's the bottom line and yeah, and defending myself and my yeah. stash. And, yeah. yeah, and it, it's, I think such a, an, an interesting thing because I think that that's true of life in general. It's true with horses. You know, if you, they like to feel that there's a give and take somewhat too, and that there's a mutual respect. And to me, in a gallery uh, artist situation, we're really partners, you oh, know, yeah. and respect the, each other that way. Um, it, it just, it's good for both of us, <laughs> yeah. in my opinion, both the artist and the gallery owner. Yeah, so let's, so let's find out how you got that good ethics. You grew up in Maryland. Is that where you originally grew up? Yes, yes. And I'd have to say it, it was definitely my parents because they both um, 
uh, my mom was just really a super good loving person in many ways, in every way it seemed. My dad was not, <laughs> he was pretty much of a curmudgeon, but um, he was, I am so grateful to this day for the, the ethics that he always showed in every situation, he just was. That's the way he saw that people should be. And um, it was a real eye opener to me when I got out in the world and realized not everybody was that way. Yeah, in fact, it's rare. <laughs> yeah, so I am very grateful that I had that good, solid moral background. Mm -hmm. He was a woodworker, right? Yes, he was. That's where he was the happiest when, when he was um, working in his, he was an engineer by trade, but in the, in his, um, in his spare time, what he loved to do was go down into his workshop and, and build things. Hmm. And I think he was the happiest when we went up to um, the land that my parents had in Pennsylvania, that was a beautiful little place um, in the mountains and down in a ravine where there was a little river and my father built a cabin there and had all his kids help carry in all the wood and all the tools and everything to build it. So as I was growing up, we would do that almost every weekend during the nice weather. And he loved it there. And I think that's why I um, have always liked being uh, in the mountains and out away from uh, suburbia, I guess, because I just remember that as the best times in my family. Everybody seemed happy. And, and you're on a river is where your house is right now. You think right. Really plus, plus, we have a cabin in the trees. Uh -huh. It's actually a little tree house, but uh, when Greg and I got married, um, Greg knew that that was something I always had wanted. So he built us a little uh, tree house down there. So it feels like going, you know, go, if we want to get away, we can go down to um, that uh, tree house. And um, I don't know, it just, without having to leave the ranch, we can go down and enjoy the river and the quiet and all that. That uh, reminds me of going to Pennsylvania. And he built that house himself? Yeah, he did. Yep. Wow. Yeah, he's quite a good builder, but uh, he had to do it in his spare time, just a couple hours in the evenings because he's working horses during the day. Yeah. Yeah. But your nice father, time. your father built that too, right? Your father built. Yes, he house. built the cabin in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and so did he make things too to sell or was it all just yeah. for himself? It was all just things that he could do. Just for the family. And yeah. we grew up like at Christmas. Um, we they always made us stuff rather than our buying things mm. and to this day that's what I prefer to do if I can is try to make gifts for people I care about so I do a lot of baking which is what my mom did but my dad would make things out of wood and I still have a lot of his things that he made so chests of drawers and different things mm -hmm. and how many um, kids were in your family uh, five kids yeah, and where do you fall in that lineage? Right smack in the middle. I had an older brother and sister and a younger brother and sister. Oh, yeah, so you're a middle child. <laughs> yeah. And did any of those children go into the arts at all besides yourself? Uh, no, um, not even close, except that my older brother, who also got into engineering, but then became a, um, he was actually a <clears throat> research scientist, uh, he um, was quite a musician and he had his own band. Mm -hmm. He was very good. But uh, now my parents, especially since my mother was in the arts, they did not see that as a very good way to go <laughs> if you were going to try to make a living at it. Well, she was a ballet, so I, right? Yes. Uh -huh. So, you know, back in, she was doing that back in the, oh, what was that? I guess the, Thir late 30s and 40s and uh, in New York City. And it was tough. I mean, oh, yeah. it was very hard. Uh, but I think they discouraged me a lot less from going that route because I was a woman. 
And my brother, though, being a man, would have to, you know, back in, in those days, in the 50s and 60s, he'd have to uh, support his family or would it be expected to. So I doubt he thought that was an option. So I feel really grateful that it worked out the way it did for me and that I was able to stay on my path. She didn't want you to be a ballerina? <laughs> no, I never quite had a talent for dancing. Oh, okay, you didn't have that. She probably saw that earlier. <laughs> but did you have a talent for art? Were you drawing or sculpting or? Oh I yeah, know? from the time I was a little kid. Yeah, she kept a lot of the early drawings I did. And even when I was in first grade, I was always pointed out to be the one to do all the art projects for the class when those needed to be done. Um, I just took to it, but it wasn't until I was um, uh, <clears throat> in, I think it was, no, it was high school that I took an arts and class class, arts and crafts class mm -hmm. that um, I started doing the, uh, the carving in one material and then casting it in a hard metal. But my dad having the workshop that he did, the wood shop, I could go down there as a little kid. And I remember even at five, six years old, he'd let me draw on a board and then cut it out on the jigsaw. And then it would be this little cut out thing and I could file down the edges and make it more rounded and then paint it. Mm. So I did a lot of that in my, at home. Uh, early on, but the casting started when I w had that arts and crafts class and learned how to do lost wax mm. casting. At that and that's time, when I still in high school, that. you learned how to do that? Yeah, yeah, and I started actually selling through my first gallery in high school because my teacher had put some of my little miniatures in a scholastic art show in Washington, D.C., and a gallery owner in Chevy Chase, Maryland, saw them and asked if he could put them in his gallery. So I started selling pretty early on. <laughs> and was that and I did when you did that? Did you go, okay, hey, I can see a path for me. I'm making these things and people are wanting them to sell and I'm making money. Yeah, but it took a while because yeah, I was doing it, but I was still in school. I went to college and then the university and during all that time, I was making them for uh, this gallery and selling them. But I still didn't know anybody who could make a living as an artist. I mean, yeah. nobody. <laughs> right. Everybody taught. So that's what I assumed I would probably do is teach art. And I did at Prince George's Community College for a couple of years once I had graduated. But then um, what really made a difference for me was uh, that was the CETA program which was a 1% for the arts mm. that they got artists. They went around and, and uh, chose some artists that could be artists in residence. And um, they would actually give you a salary. <laughs> so that gave me a transition time where I could see how I could actually, because then I wasn't having to put in all the hours to teach and I could work on my own um, art and suddenly galleries started being interested in showing and I expanded on that. And I realized I probably could make a run of it. So I did. And so when you went to college, this was Maryland, University of Maryland? Yeah, although one semester I went to Baltimore Institute of Art, another one to the Corcoran uh, in DC, just because there were classes that I wanted to take there. So I would go take a semester off and go to another school that had a an especially good teacher or whatever that I wanted to work with. You were getting a BFA in yeah. art and that's how you ended up getting it from Maryland was your final University of Maryland? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so when you graduate from there with an art degree, that's when you go and start doing um, teaching? Uh, yes, I taught for two years at, at uh, Prince George's Community College. Uh -huh. And did yeah, you know pretty art. much why, when you were doing it, I don't want to do this for the, the long haul. I want to make my art. Well, um, I actually enjoyed it quite a bit because at the community college, there are a lot of um, older students that um, 
the some as old as in their 60s, but you know, the range went from young college students up uh, being a community college. And um, they were also enthusiastic about it, you know, because as older students, they're taking it because they really want to do it. They right. really want to learn. So I actually enjoyed it very much. What I saw though, is that it, that takes a lot of creativity to teach and, um, and energy. And uh, I just felt that if I could be putting that into my own artwork, it could expand and grow so much faster. So when I saw that there was possibly an opportunity to do that, because I was showing in a gallery in Annapolis and they were doing so well, they were selling everything I could get to them that I thought, okay, this is that time mm. when I can um, uh, make that jump and I can be pretty safe. I'm only having to take care of myself. I can live pretty uh, inexpensively. So if things don't go too well, <laughs> right. uh, be all right. So um, I finally made that jump and uh, it definitely was the right, right decision for me, I'd say. And so you're just like mid twenties when you make that jump? Yes. Yeah, and yes. that was, must have been somewhere around the Vietnam War as well, wasn't it? Somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And being, uh, growing up right outside of DC, like our home was about uh, half an hour from downtown town DC. You know, your news is international news and, and what was going on in the world was very, very present to all of us. And of course, what was going on at the campuses, I was a real activist then about involving all that stuff. And uh, it, I think that helped uh, to some degree shape me and just being aware of the greater world. And um, I, I'm grateful to have been turning into a, an adult during that period. I guess I'd have to put it that way. Yeah. It was a very interesting and exciting time in a lot of ways. Yeah, and scary. Yes, and scary. Yeah. But exciting, in order to, for it to be exciting, you almost have to have that element of danger after all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because so, were you out there with the protests and that kind of thing? Um, a little bit. I wasn't so much into into doing the um, actual protesting because I didn't see that as being that um, producing the results necessarily. But I was active in terms of other ways, writing and stuff like that, I, mm -hmm. and being involved with certain groups. Um, yeah, and the um, yeah. So anyway, just a lot of different things that went on that then that had me feel pretty excited about the way the country was going. And I felt pretty proud of my generation. Mm -hmm. And that shaped you too, you think, because of how you are now? Yeah, I think it shaped everyone. Well, yeah, I, ha I know I have, um, uh, I've been shaped a lot by the attitudes. I no longer feel that um, I need to be a news junkie. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think that can be uh, not good for the creative process to a great degree. It's one thing if you feel, I think if you feel um, you can actively do something about it, but if you're just hearing all this negativity and you're, you're not in a position to be able to do something, it just makes you feel helpless. Mm, yeah. And so, yeah, I prefer to focus on the real positive. And I think that that kind of energy and attitude probably helps our human condition as much as anything. Mm. You know, having a good attitude and being just following through with being a good person and being kind as you can, I think is really important. Yeah. That, for that, that also shows up in your sculpture, I think. There's oh, a, well, it, you. I do. I think there's a sense of uh, curiosity and um, emotion that you can see in your sculptures for sure, happiness even. And certain ones like the weaver, you know, with her hands and there's just certain things that, yeah, it does come through in your sculpture and your and, and, and all of them, not just your human figures, but I think your, uh, your animal figures as well. You know, there's something that just like the horse behind you, just, you know, <laughs> a little colt, whatever, scratching, <laughs> biting its butt, you know? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Well, you know, it's, uh, what really stuck with me shortly after I came to Santa Fe, I got to know Elaine Horowitz a little bit. And then when she passed away, uh, um, Arlene Llewellyn wound up in that gallery and I got to know her a little bit. And then when she passed away, I went to um, a memorial to celebrate her life. And one of her staff got up and talked about how much um, Arlene had influenced all of their lives and the attitude she had towards the world that they felt really helped them in being, um, oddly enough, good salespeople and developing relationships. And that was, she told them at the start, it was important to her that they all remember to be genuine, present, and kind. And when you think of those three words and what they encompass, it's almost everything. I mean, if you can be that in your life and inspire others to be that, what a different world we'd have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, that kind of really changed my thinking. It really uh, struck me way back then that that was important to always keep in mind. Mm. From a dealer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Surprising. Um, yeah. Yeah. We should all be that way. Now you came to Santa Fe. Why did you come to Santa Fe? Cause you came early, like 85 or something. Yeah, it was 85. Good memory. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was to find a good foundry because on the East coast, there were very few. Um, the ones that were halfway good were up in, well, I shouldn't say halfway good. They were good. They were just, they took forever and they were up in New York. Uh, for the most part. And um, I just was frustrated with it because you take them a piece and even if it was a little piece, it could take a year before they could get it back. Oh, yeah. So um, yeah, cast and finish. So um, I went to an exhibit, a Remington exhibit in um, the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. And I saw these miniatures done by um, Del Weston of Santa Fe, who was a foundry man. Mm -hmm. He had a foundry there. And so I came out, connected up with him, and um, I used that foundry for 32 years until he retired. But uh, that's what I came out for. I really needed good, a good foundry that was gonna be reliable and I needed to be close to them so I could work with them. Uh, Cause a lot of my stuff is detailed. It's not very simple to cast. And uh, I was, we had a great relationship over all those years. His daughter was only 17 when, uh, when she was managing his foundry for him. And she was just wonderful to work with, Linda West in all those years. But um, I, I came out here not having any idea what it was gonna be like. And moving out to Santa Fe, it was, it was an amazing eye opener for me. I just had no idea. I had no idea, and this is, I, I'm embarrassed to admit it. I had no idea that there were nations within our nations, like the Navajo Nation and the Hopi out here uh, that were sovereign countries. I, I, you know, I, it was the whole thing about living in the Southwest was so very different than living on the East Coast near Washington, D.C. Um, the, the landscape, the people, the climate, it was all so new and I loved it. And I knew then that I was never gonna live anyplace else. I, I love it in the Southwest. It just yeah. um, struck the right chord on so many levels. And to me that the term enchantment fits so well because the, the beauty and the mystery and all that that I think are, are throughout these Southwestern lands um, continues to um, excite me and inspire me. And, and I feel very grateful to have made the choice to come out here that early in my life. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. You just follow this guy because you see him in the Smithsonian. His, 
sculptures and you come out you just you just came out on your own you said i'm gonna did you call him up or anything or did you just oh yeah yeah, yeah i called and we set things up and i we talked and then i wound up dealing with the foundry for two years before i could move out yes uh so because my husband was um working on a book he was an author too uh but he did nonfiction. So he needed to be near research. And when he finished that book, we were able to move out. And, um, and being in the area inspired him to write a story that was a true story based in Farmington. Mm. And it was a murder mystery kind of thing. And uh, it was dealing with um, uh, three Navajo men who were um, tortured and murdered back in the 70s. And what story was behind that but what was beautiful about that for me the collateral beauty from that was that um, I got to go with Rod out to the reservation when he was interviewing some of the the um, people who were involved in the story and we would go on the reservation and speak to um, some of the Indian families and um, that again was, it was such an education for me and opened my eyes to a lot of the beauty and mystery and challenges of, of the people who live on the reservation. And it was uh, quite an education. And I, I thought it was fascinating. I loved it. It inspired several of the pieces like the, the adopted daughter of um, one of the widows of the men murdered um, was only uh, 12 years old when we started going out and interviewing. And um, Rod's busy with, uh, with um, the widow. And so I would interact with this daughter who was extremely shy. And we just, my sister is a very shy person. So I'm attracted to that, I guess. And uh, we just really hit it off. And she wound up inviting me to her Canalda ceremony. Oh, wow. The four day event. Yeah. I, I'm sure you know about yep, these. I do. And it has a, a medicine woman that comes in. And again, it's, it was just an amazing experience. So that was an introduction to a very exotic culture to me. And, um, and one that had, was filled with um, a lot of poignancy and, and characters that I so respected and had a kind of um, inner strength and peace that I've always aspired to myself. And so it just, it was just, the timing was so good for me in terms of having that influence in my life too. And that's when you started doing native subjects in your sculpture? Mm -hmm. Yes. Point particularly women. Yeah. And maybe that's because that that was my portal into their culture was more through the women. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel. So make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.